So today's Good News Sunday. You know what good news is also a word. What's the word in the Bible for good news? Gospel. And so, you know, a lot of people have no idea what the gospel is. Probably sitting here not right now, some of you young people, adults, visitors, watching online. You use the word, you hear it. But for a lot of people, it's a musical genre. There's rap, there's hip hop, there's um, uh, contemporary, there's jazz, there's classical, there's contemporary ballads, mainstream kind of music, elevator music. And the gospel is just, yeah, the gospel. The gospel, yeah, I know the gospel. That's a style of music. And then there's, there's uh, black gospel, southern gospel. It, my, I was in shock. I told the church this morning, many years ago, Carolyn and I, with her traveling group, we went to Japan, where there's a very, very, very small percentage of people who are Christians. Japan is one of those communities and cultures where you don't go outside of what the mass is doing, what the family, what the culture is doing. No one's been a Christian. What do you mean you're a Christian? We don't do Christian here. So I was surprised when they invited us and they, in Fukuoka, Tokyo, the capital, and Osaka, um, in three places they rent, Carol did a big music conference there with people who wanted to be trained and learn parts to sing, and none of them were Christians. And they filled three Carnegie Hall type buildings. Carol, do you remember that, that first night in, in, in Tokyo? When the first song started, the place was packed. Nice, I thought conservative, you know, uh, it's a conservative culture. Everybody's wearing suits and nice dresses. Suddenly, the, but they started up like that song, uh, He's working it out for you. Song like that. They made a mad rush for the platform. I'm talking about hundreds of people running at the platform. Am I right, Carol? And I was sitting side stage and I went, oh no, they're going to attack my wife from behind here. (laughs) She's leading them. And I couldn't believe it. And they just stood. None of them were Christian. None of them knew what gospel meant. In fact, at at the end of the concert, I got up and tried to explain to them, doing the best I could, by the help of God. It's not a musical genre. It's a message from God in the Bible. It's the only way to salvation. But they didn't know what salvation meant. And you know how that happened? One movie, Sister Act. (laughs) How many know Sister Act? Lift your hand. That movie hit, and then the follow-up, hit so big in Japan that everyone went crazy for gospel music. I said insane for gospel music. They would hire groups to sing in their weddings a gospel song. They'll travel and pay money to see people get up and sway and sing with a gospel kind of feel, right? Especially like a black gospel feel. You remember Sister Act, right? Uh... There's nothing in the do, 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 but my God, my God. How many remember that? Well, listen, that went, that went viral there in, in Japan. So people were coming up and running at the platform. They never jumped on the platform, but they just stood there. And then at the end, you know, they, their face was like, what? It's not a style of music? You mean there's a message behind it? There's such a thing as what, the gospel? So I wanna give you the simplest, best, one of the easiest ways to present the gospel and we'll see if you know what the gospel is. So, because we get mixed up gospel with religion, like the church we grew up in, Roman Catholic, Pentecostal, uh, Baptist, whatever it is, and then those things can sometimes get bent and now you're getting a message, but it's not the gospel that, is found in the Bible. You know, as the centuries go by, people just add stuff to it. How many get what I'm talking about? And now you're not getting pure, simple gospel. You're getting join the church and this and, and whatever. So, so here's the simple gospel. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in a manger. We celebrate that coming up. And um, 
uh, we lose track of him from his birth. And then they ran to Egypt because they wanted to kill the baby. And then he came back and they settled in Nazareth, Mary and Joseph, Joseph being supposedly his father, but he was born by immaculate conception. And uh, he grew up there and we know nothing about him at seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. But at 12, where there's a uh, writing about him in the temple, they went for a, a holy day celebration Mary and Joseph and Jesus got lost and they're heading back and they can't find him and they go back to Jerusalem and there he is in the temple asking questions of the religious leaders and, and, and answering some of theirs way beyond his years. Then we lose track of him again. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We know nothing. He was a carpenter, carpenter's son. He never preached a sermon that anyone's aware of. He never did one miracle, never did anything. He laid low because that's what God wanted him to do. And the will of God is not always doing, sometimes it's being quiet and just waiting. At 30, the spirit gave him his trigger mechanism and he went to the Jordan River where John the Baptist was baptizing people and Jesus was baptized, although he didn't need to repent of anything. And when he came up out of the water, the spirit of God came upon him in a visible form. And now he was being equipped for ministry. I mean, imagine that. Jesus needed to be anointed and have the spirit come down upon him to make possible his ministry, which involves so many miracles. So immediately from there, he went into the wilderness where he was tested uh, by Satan and tempted. And coming out of that, he began to minister and uh, miraculous things were happening. His words had authority. The other religious teachers in that Jewish economy were, were just, they were just talking, flapping their lips. And, but his message had power. And the people were saying, where, where did this guy get his authority? How does he talk like that? So now he goes to his hometown. And they only know him as the kid who used to be in the street. They only know him as the carpenter's son, as they thought. So now here you're gonna get it right in a beautiful way. This will help all of us. It will really help you. So look at here, Luke 4. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, Shabbat, Saturday, he went into the synagogue. The synagogue were those like little, there was the temple in Jerusalem, but during the time of their dispersion and time of captivity, when they were thrown out of the land of Israel, the, the, the concept of synagogues developed and they would have leaders and they couldn't do sacrifices there, could only do that in the temple, but that's where they met. It's really a, 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 a prototype of what we call the church now, where we meet together. So he went in there as was his custom and he stood up to read. And uh, being 30 years old and able to, uh, as a mature adult to read part of the scriptures as part of the ceremony, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and unrolling it, he found the pleb. The, the scroll was like this, right? It wasn't like a book. It was a scroll and he went and found and uh, he found the place where it is written, Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news, gospel, good news to the poor. That word there means those who are afflicted and in need. And he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today, this scripture from hundreds of years before is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, 
all that Isaiah wrote about the coming Messiah, this anointing of someone in the future, Isaiah said, this was the Messiah that all of Israel was waiting for. Many, many prophecies in the Old Testament, one of the proofs of the Bible's veracity. Many, many dozens of prophecies about the coming Messiah. Micah even tells us where he would be born, Bethlehem. Remember that this Christmas. It was foretold hundreds of years before. Isaiah in another place says how he'll die beaten half to death before they crucify him and, and that his face was so messed up nobody could even recognize him. But one of the prophecies about the Messiah coming was he would be anointed and he would do those things that we just said, preach the gospel, bring good news to the poor and so on and so forth. So let's look and then Jesus said, Today, this is it. I'm him. Didn't say I'm him, but he said, this is fulfilled now. This is the good news. Let's just look at Isaiah 61, where it's being quoted from, more or less. The spirit of, this is hundreds of years before. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, not Isaiah, not Israel, on the Messiah. It's prophetic. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Now now notice this, this is different. Jesus didn't say the second part. He just said this first part of verse two, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In other words, salvation is now. I'm here. It's yours. I have a gift. Will you receive it? Will you trust me? But he left out the day of vengeance of our God because that was going to be in his second coming. Do you know that Jesus is coming again? Though your mind can't understand it, though the culture laughs at it, there's more prophecies in the Bible that he would come a second time than he would come the first time. He came the first time, he's surely coming a second time. But it won't be a day of God's favor, it's gonna be a day of judgment, the vengeance of God on all of those who mock God, mock Christ, take his name in vain, mock Christians, reject and and pressure churches and persecute Christians, and those who flaunt their sin and say, I'll do whatever I wanna do, let me see you take me out. He's waiting now because he's patient. But there'll come a day when he's gonna open all the books and he's gonna make everything right. Amen? Amen. Awesome day. Awesome day. If you're not prepared for that day, you're not prepared. So Jesus said, here's the good news. I'm giving you the good news. Forget what you heard in church before and forget what I heard because I did not hear the pure gospel growing up as a real little kid. I heard legalism, Jesus with a lot of rules. Uh, Go to church on Sunday, try to live a good life. Hey, hey, try to live a good life and then you'll make it in. And you never knew if you would make it in. So everyone who ever gave a testimony, when I was a kid, I would hear people testify and say, I wanna thank God for this and that and pray for me that I'll make it in. I was thinking, in where, where are you going? No, pray for me because you never were sure if you could make it in. But that's not the Christianity of the Bible. How many are sure today while she was singing, I am saved, you're gonna make it in, amen? So here's the gospel, here's the good news, not a musical genre. God so loved the world that he gave his son who eventually is gonna die on the cross and shed his blood as she sang so that our sins can be forgiven. That's the good news. Your sins can never be erased except through Jesus Christ. Go to church every day of the week. It will not erase any sin. Cry a river of tears. It will not erase one sin. Tears don't erase sin. Only the blood of Jesus erases sin and brings forgiveness and brings pardon and brings a new beginning and a new start. So when Jesus came before he got to that awful day on the cross, he said this, the spirit of has anointed me, the spirit is on me to bring good news to the poor. Poor how? Poor in money? Could be, but it could be just poor in general. The word means afflicted, in need. 
So Jesus came to help people who don't have what they need to have. Could be money, could be a lot of things. But let me just give you a couple that are outstanding. He came to fulfill God's will for us. God always wanted his people that he loves to have peace, and there is no peace in the world. So when he came to bring good news to the poor, one of those things is like you up in the balcony or down here, you go to church, you have money maybe, you have security, you have a 401k, whatever, and and all of that, but you don't have peace. No, you don't have peace. Only Jesus through the good news, brings peace. You can have a billion dollars. You can have security wrapped up, but there's, there's no tranquility in your soul. There's that uneasiness, isn't there? Like, I could lose this in a second. What happens when I die? What if the people I trust turn on me? I mean, if money gave people peace, just think, you can't read the newspapers today about the exposés now on how some of the you know, uh, superstars live and the animalistic things they did and do. You can't read it hardly without soiling yourself. Am I correct? Well, don't they have peace? If you have all that money, don't you have peace? Can't you just sit in a chair and enjoy life? No, you can't because you have no peace. Money doesn't bring peace. Rock and roll, sex and song and and, and what, that's why a lot of people are always on their phone because they have no peace. They cannot sit in a chair and just say, thank you, God, for your peace. They got to be, no, let me see. Let me, am I correct or not? They can't live. You take the phone away, they're going to have withdrawal. They will have withdrawal. Speaking of withdrawal, Later on, later on this year, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a knee replacement. All that basketball, all that hooping it up for years, tennis, paddle ball, softball, punch ball, stick ball. That's all I ever did. My dad drank a lot when I was growing up, so I'd be in the playground all day. Well, it, and all the travel and preaching. So my, I'm going to have a transplant, uh, uh, not a transplant, a, a new knee, a knee what? What's it called? Replacement. All right, all right, all right. So I'm going to have a replacement. And now I just found out this week that when it's over, they get a block on it first. I don't know what a block is, but it sounds like I know what I'm talking about. They put a block so you don't feel anything for a day, day and a half. After that, they give you morphine for a day. Morphine, it'd be strong, right? Then they're going to give me Oxycontin. Exactly. Now, you don't have to take it for five or six days, but they say you're going to need it for two or three days at least. But Oxycontin, I never have taken anything like that into my body. What if I get hooked? (laughs) You're laughing. I'm not laughing. You see me laughing up here? What if I'm hooked and they put me in Teen Challenge? And they bring the guys from Teen Challenge and they put them up in the balcony for a meeting. And you look up there and you well, I know that guy. Isn't that Pastor Symbol up there? You just pray for me. I don't like painkillers. I don't want to take any of that. Anybody ever take Oxycontin? Let me see your hands. Okay. We'll talk at the meeting. You can coach me. So, there's no peace for people who don't know the God of peace, who don't know the Prince of peace. You can have everything, but there's no peace. No, you don't have peace. Not the peace. The peace that you know is when things are going good, you have peace. And when the bottom falls out and goes sideways, you lost your peace. What kind of peace is that? Everything's shaky in your life and will be till the day you die because only Jesus brings peace. A lot of you are short right now and you have need. The gospel is for you because you don't have peace. When you love someone, the first thing you want is them to have peace. You can't enjoy a good meal without peace. You can't enjoy your children if you don't have peace. Nothing is anything without peace. And Jesus came to give peace. He said, later on, peace I give you, not as the world gives. 
I give a peace that nobody can take away. The other thing that we're in need of, bring good news to the, to the poor, those in need, is joy. How many people are just driven because they have no joy? They need entertainment or that phone or something because they can't sit alone and be quiet because they have no joy. And inside, they're so unhappy, they're searching for something. And the, and the models in, in our culture, they, they, they get married seven times, looking around, the other one cheat on the whatever, and why? I'm looking for that new high because I have no joy in myself. And G, Jesus was sent, here's the good news. You can have peace and joy without spending five cents. And it's a peace and joy that will never leave you. So the whole, the whole culture is a lie. Do this, have this, experience this, and then you'll have, you'll have nothing. You have momentary shots of, 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 of happiness or a high. A moment of tranquility, maybe a millisecond, and then it's gone. Jesus, I got new good news for you. My father has been looking down and he sees what your needs are. Notice how practical this is. He says, I've also, here's the good news. I've come to heal the brokenhearted. No psychiatrist can heal your broken heart. No pastoral counseling can heal your broken heart. We can help you and point you to Jesus, but only Jesus can take. Listen, when your best friend or your wife or your husband or someone you love does it to you dirty and hurts you, wounds you, deserts you, abandons you, tries to slander you, gossips about you, and you're just wounded and can barely go on. Jesus can come and heal that broken heart. Wait, wait, wait. I have no idea how he does it. I do not to this day understand how he heals broken hearts, but he is friend of a wounded heart. If you listen, your heart is wounded today and you're covering that up like the young lady said. By the way, didn't she speak good? That that young lady's after my job. Better not go in that program. <laughs> She'll be up here preaching. No, that was very special. So, so a broken heart, if you try to cover it up, it just forms scar tissue. And that'll reassert itself with the right trigger. A lot of people who go off, it's because they're trying to cover up the anger, the hurt, the bitterness inside of them. Because only Jesus can heal that. Only Jesus can. And if you're here today, I'm telling you, only Jesus can. And he didn't charge you anything. And it has nothing to do with the Brooklyn Tabernacle. And you don't have to do anything, but you got to have a transaction with Jesus. Not church. Don't be a Roman Catholic. Don't be a Pentecostal. Don't be a Baptist. Don't be an evangelical. Be a human being that has a relationship with Jesus Christ. Come on, let's say amen to that. Amen. So... Know how practical God is. He knows that life has some. Isn't it true that when someone breaks your heart, it's worse than a punch in the stomach? How many know what I'm talking about? Just lift your hand. Oh, when someone wounds you. But not only that, he says, I've come to set the captives free. Well, I'm not in jail. What are you talking about? I'm not a captive. You see chains on me? There's invisible chains. Anger, hate, immorality, pornography, alcohol, drugs, trying to get accepted by a crowd that doesn't even care about you, but driven, you're driven. When you're in captivity, when you're in prison, you are bound, you're chained. I've been lots of times down to Louisiana State Penitentiary in, called Angola in Louisiana. Average sentence, 91 years. Carol's been there with a traveling group years ago. A video was made. And I've been down there a lot of times. You've met some of my friends who have come out of there. And there, you, you, you're restrained. I met a guy who had been in the same cell 23 hours a day, one hour out for a shower and a workout, 23 hours a day for 34 years, same cell. 
same cell. So he's restricted. He can't do what he wants. He can't go out and buy a hamburger. He can't do anything. Why? He's in a prison. He got bars. Even the ones who live in the dormitory, they, they, someone has to see you every one or two hours, if I remember correctly. But the guys that are locked up, they locked up. And death row is locked up 23 hours a day. So you might say, I don't need to be set free, but don't you get it? Whatever gets into us, sin that begins to control us, we're a prisoner to it. You can't be free. You can't be what God wants you to be because that thing, when it calls you, like they say about crack, when it calls you, you're coming. And when temptation comes and a besetting sin has locked itself in, there's no freedom. You can't get away from it. Except when Jesus comes. He sets the captives free. Oh, that's a lot of emotional. What are you trying to do? Melodramatic, psychological stuff. No, I'm, I'm reading the Bible to you. He's come to set the captives free. You can be bound by whatever it is. Only Jesus will set you free. You can make a thousand promises. You can read more scriptures every day thinking there's some formula. There is no formula. There's a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, son of the living God. Let's say amen to that. That's the one who sets free. Titus says somewhere in that book, uh, Paul writing to a minister named Titus, the, the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodly desires. Listen. The grace of God teaches us, not the Brooklyn Tabernacle, not Pastor Symbola, not anybody. The grace of God, i.e. Jesus, risen from the dead, operating through the Holy Spirit. He gives us the power to say no. And we've said yes 10,000 times. But now he gives us the inner strength through the Spirit to say no. No, I'm not. That's why the Bible says we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. So he came to set the captives free. I wonder how many, as my brother comes here to play, and Carol, if you go on the organ, I wonder how many here are just, you're secretly captive. See, these are things we don't talk about. It's not easy because we're afraid people look down on us. But whom the sun sets free? What's the rest of that? Whom the sun sets free is free. Say it with me. Whom the sun sets free is free. Mas fuerte. Say it. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. So that's the gospel. Notice, not he's just saying, here's what I'm offering. These are the gifts I have. If you'll believe me, follow me. I'll give you the grace. But there's more, one last one. He says, he brings the blind person or the one in a dungeon out into the light so they can see where they are. You can have a great job today and you have, no, you have a PhD and you have no idea where you're going. You don't understand life. You don't understand eternity because only Jesus can open your eyes where you see what really is going on around you. When without the Lord, all we see is, you know, three inches in front of us. And we think we're educated because we learned a few things and we made a few dollars. But Jesus said, no, let me open your eyes and let the light shine in. Here's the thing about walking in the dark when you're blinded. You keep running into things that hurt you. I've told the story before, just real quick. I lived on Parkside Avenue between Bedford and Flatbush growing up. And we had a basement that was a mess, but there was a ping pong table down there. I used to play with my brother, but there was just junk all around. My dad was, when he was sober, was doing woodworking stuff and drills and clamps and every kind of thing. And there was a light, but I knew it so well I could just walk around. One day I just went down the stairs and, uh, Running through it, I didn't realize there were no lights on that. My father had put a box, a heavy box filled with wrenches and tools right where I was running through. But I didn't see it. You're in the dark. I hit that thing. A yell came up from me. 
you could have heard it in Alaska. Oh, how many have ever stubbed your toe at night? Well, this was like breaking my foot. But why did I hit it? Because I couldn't see. That's why some of you, your, your eye, you, you think you see. I thought I saw. But when the Lord opens your eyes, you go, oh, my goodness. No, I'm avoiding that. I never even saw that before. How did I not see how dangerous that is? Oh, now I know my purpose in life. Now I can stay in my lane. I've been in all the wrong lanes. Now I got my lane. That's what Jesus said. The Spirit is on me now. So I can help the poor and those in need of peace and joy and whatever. And I've come to heal the brokenhearted people who are wounded. They won't admit it, but they're wounded. I've come to heal them and get them back together. I know I have no idea how he does that, but he does it. And I set the captives free. I can set the captives free. You know, a lot of us just obey the last whisper that we get in our mind. We have to obey it. So out of Angola, it was an 81-year-old man when he came to us. He had been in prison for 52, 51 years. They call him Bishop Tannehill, Eugene Tannehill. He was released into the custody of myself and his church after serving 51, 52 years. He shot someone in a bar when he was like 18 or 19. So in his 70s. So he came, and I never knew what institutionalized meant. I had heard the word like, no, the guy is institutionalized. He's been serving 20, 30 years. Well, he was 50 years. So he came. We greeted him. I knew him from my visits. He came into the auditorium. Carol was up here with some singers working on a project. And uh, he said hello. We went up to my office. We sat in my office. Three or four others are there. We talked and rejoiced. Thank God he's out. Oh, was he happy. And he was just sitting there, very staring at me. Imagine he had never handled a dollar for 50 years. He had never seen an escalator. He, he was in another whole world. So he served hard time. So what happened? Someone said, come on, let's all go out to eat and celebrate bishops with us. So we're going to go out to a restaurant. I think we went just simple right down the corner when the diner was open. So... By the way, you know what's coming in for the diner, right? Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A is opening up. You better be in church. I'm going to go down there and pull you out of there if I find out you're eating when you should be in church. How many like Chick-fil-A? How many don't like it? Lift your hand. All right, we got one. Pastor Brian Petrie is addicted to their iced tea pray for him he told me that when it opens he's going to do all his counseling in one booth that will have his name in it so we said let's go out to eat so he never moved everybody got up I'm fussing with my desk just cleaning up something and he just sat there and he kept staring at me I said Bishop he went Pastor Mbla, do you want me to get up and go out that door And I said, this is all new to me. I said, yeah. Well, of course, it's the only way out of my office. He said, you want me to do that? He could only obey the last order he got. And that's what happens when you're chained by sin. You obey the last prompting that you get from, you can't say no. That was the thing about him, because in prison, you don't say no to anyone. A guard or anyone says, do something, you don't go, no, I don't feel like it. You'll be in isolation for six months. This is what Jesus said, I'm going to set you free. You'll be able to move around, be what I want you to be. Like the young lady said, like the young lady said, you know, open up and let the Lord come in. So you would think, let me close, you would think that after that, everybody would just fall on their face and say, sign me up, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to be a part of this. I tell you, the Bible tells it like it is. This is just, I'm going to do speed reading, so just follow me. So, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. And now here comes the twist. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? In other words, they said, wait, 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 wait. 
Where'd you get all this? This isn't making sense to me. We know you. You're from this town. Who, who, who gave you all this stuff? And, and if you're really who you say you are, do a miracle like I heard you done in Capernaum. In other words, they weren't going to receive Jesus on Jesus' terms. They wanted Jesus on their terms. That's the way it is with some of you. Right now, this is why you're missing out. You want God to work in your life, but on your terms. I have news for you. Here's the bulletin. Jesus doesn't work on anyone else's terms. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And listen, we follow him. He does not follow you. Now notice the turn here. This is unbelievable. Jesus said to them, surely you'll quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you'll tell me, do here in your own hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. In other words, in his own hometown, they could not reverence him, respect him, and honor him. But now he goes further because he knows of their Jewish prejudice that they have inside of them. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. God only sent to no Jew. God sent him to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. That means a non-Jew. God can do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. He is the center of the universe, not Jim Cimbala. And then he goes further. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha who followed Elijah, the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman, the Syrian. And now he's saying to them, you're telling me what to do? I can do what I want to do. God, the wind blows where it wants to blow. God's going to bless whoever he wants to bless. I'm asking you to believe in me and receive what I've promised. But now you want to to keep me in your agenda. I don't go by your agenda. I am the Lord. I am the Savior. I am Messiah. I don't follow you. You have to follow me. But their pride was too much. When they heard that he lifted up the fact that Gentiles were blessed and not a Jew, they went sideways. Look what happened. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. He was in the synagogue teaching, and they said, wow, he's got something. But when he didn't fit their little pattern, their package, what they like, young people wanted like young, olders wanted young. I know it's got to be black. It's got to be white. No, it's got to be American. No, it's got to, it's got to be nothing. It's got to be Jesus. Jesus comes the way Jesus comes. Come on, let's say amen to that. You watching online, you clap too. But he walked right through the crowd. He used that authority he had. Walked right through them before they could kill him. My last word is this. This little end, that's odd the way that comes right after what he says in the synagogue. It, It tells me this. Look at me. There's no middle ground with Jesus nobody here is sitting on the fence you cannot be neutral you either accept Jesus on Jesus terms and let him bless you and save you and humble yourself and stop telling him what to do or you end up against him there are no neutral people don't anyone here tell me no I'm not an all out Christian but listen I'm basically I enjoy reading no no you're against him you're either for him or you're against him There is no middle ground. I don't care if you're a deacon in a church and you're watching. You're either for Jesus, following Jesus, surrender to Jesus, or you end up wanting to throw him off the brow of a hill. That's why he was crucified. Not because he didn't do miracles, not because his teaching was no good, because he didn't fit in with the status quo. So now that's the question here today. The good news can be rejected. They had it and they went, nah, I don't want it. I want my way. I want my religion. I'm used to doing things my way. I'm not going to just surrender. He's saying, no, I'll do all of this for you. Just trust me like a child and follow me. I'll change your life from the inside out. Do you realize balcony downstairs? He'll change you in a millisecond from the inside out. 
He'll give you a new heart and a new mind. Aren't you tired of being tired? I want to be bold now. Aren't you tired of being sick and tired? Aren't you tired of trying and living or trying to live a good life? And you're not living a good life, good enough life to go to heaven. No one does. You got to have Jesus as the captain on your ship. You got to give him everything. Just submit to him. See what it, he's not going to lie. He's going to do all those things. He'll give you what you need, peace and joy. He'll break the chains. He'll, he'll mend your broken heart. You don't need religion today. You need Jesus. A relationship, a trust in Jesus. Do you hear what I'm saying today? That's the good news. Whatever color you are, money, no money, doesn't matter. Homeless. Jesus changes everything. That's why he came. Could you close your eyes? This morning, God blessed the meeting. And so many stood and said, Lord, uh, Pastor, the Lord was speaking to me while you were talking. I could feel it in my heart. And I'm not going to be too proud to admit it. I need to accept the Lord today or draw near to the Lord today. There's something not right in my relationship with the Lord. I want these things promised. The peace, the joy, the power over sin. I want my heart healed from all the junk that's gone down in my life. Pastor, if you only knew, I don't know, but I can't change that. I can't heal you, but Jesus can heal you in the inside. And your eyes will open, the light will go on, and you'll see, oh, now I get it, what life is about. I thought life was about this stuff. It's not about this stuff. That stuff passes away. I got to be involved with this other thing because it lasts forever. Could you just stand if you'd like me to pray for you? Just that the Lord is talking to you and you're not going to be like the crowd who got furious with them. You're willing to say, Lord, here I am. I trust you. Thank 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 you. Not religion. Not trying harder. Believing in the good news. He wants to do this for you and me. No wonder the angels must be in awe how people reject these, this grace of God, this blessing, this not asking you for money. He's not asking, he's just asking you to believe and own up that you need him. Lord, don't let pride or self-consciousness stop anyone from receiving the good news that I've proclaimed today. Help them to stand, then come forward so they can pray and be blessed today with a new beginning in their life. That's what you promise. If you're standing, would you come forward, please? People that have come forward looking at me. You know, my daughter said something while she was leading worship, and it went like through a knife through me. She said, It's not by accident you're here today. Do you realize that now? Look up at me. Not by accident. He brought you here, you heard his word. He wants to do something beautiful in your life. Am I correct? But it's not by accident. I don't know. This this family is visiting from Brazil. I've never seen them before. But God had a purpose them here today. And all of you precious people. So here's what I want you to do now. Even if you've never sung that loud, I want you to sing real loud with the congregation. Come on, sing. I'm going to ask you all to repeat after me in the front. Congregation, if you would help them by repeating after me. Dear God. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood that was shed for me. I confess my sins. Be merciful and forgive me. 
Thank you for the good news. Heal my broken heart. Break the chains that hold me. Open my eyes that I might see all that you have for me. Give me that peace. Fill me with that joy that you promised. I can't believe you did it. While I was a sinner, you died for me. I say yes to you. I'm going to follow you. By your strength every day. I'm going to be a Christian. Live like one. Talk like one. Give me a new mind. Give me a new heart. Do what you promised. Lord, do what you promised. You're not a man that you should lie. So do it in my life. Thank you for your love. Amen.